Yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in to the 10th um, episode of Web3 Social Club. It's a special occasion for the program. And also like we're so excited to have uh, Professor Galloway uh, from NYU and Isidro from NextID with us today. So for those that are tuning in for the first time, um, my name is Hannah. I lead Growth and Mask Network, which is a social infrastructure project that bridges Web2 and Web3 to build an open internet, giving data ownership back to the users. I'm also the uh, marketing co uh, signature owner of Next.ID, which is a decentralized open source uh, DID uh, protocol for all self-governed digital identities across Web2 and Web3 profiles um, and for Web3 uh, protocols and dApps to build upon uh, as the foundational step uh, to build a truly decentralized social network. And our Twitter space, Web3 Social Club, this is a uh, Twitter space series by Mass Network, where we invite projects, uh, thought leaders and builders of the next generation social networks and infrastructure um, to share their insights on how we can truly like enhance our digital ownership and rights in the cyberspace. So I'm uh, truly honored to have Professor Scott uh, Galloway um, here with us uh, as a speaker to discuss why decentralized identity matters. Um, Scott is a professor of marketing at NYU Stern, and he's also the founder of L2 Red Envelope and Profit, uh, the best-selling author mm -hmm. of, uh, of The Four and uh, Algebra of Happiness. Um, yeah, uh, well, welcome to uh, Web3 Social Club, Scott. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, great. We also have uh, Issa Liu from NextID. Uh, he is the maintainer and initiator of NextID uh, Open Source DID Aggregation Protocol and uh, also the founder of DWeb Shanghai, an active contributor to the open decentralized web movement. Uh, great to have you here, Issa, as well. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Today. Um, I think so for today's like a discussion will be a bit different from the, our like traditional uh, Twitter space format. Um, I know like, you know, you see you have a lot of things you want to um, share and ask uh, Professor Galloway. So maybe we can do it like more of a uh, kind of a, a like back and forth, like a dialogue style. Um, we have some questions prepared and maybe you see you can uh, take the floor and, and start mm -hmm. uh, you know discussing the questions with uh, Scott. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thank you so much. Yeah. And yeah, thank you so much for coming today, Scott. Um, I guess like uh, everybody is talking about like digital identities or like decentralized identities nowadays because like there are like so many new projects uh, focusing on like this new technology. Uh, can you just give us like some opinions or like some comments on why uh, or like what is the significance of these like digital identities, especially the decentralized identities? Yeah, I just think of it from a utility perspective, and that is if you've got a driver's license or when I go back to London, I'll go through Fast Track where I'll just my passport will be scanned. Uh, or if you want to not fill out a questionnaire every time you go to see your doctor, um, there's some form of decentralized identification taking place. So the idea of a, a of a kind of an offsite storage repository that ultimately gets secured, verified, and then connected to provide utility that's then centralized and then then uh, relocated or distributed out to the point of utility. I mean, I mean there's just a tremendous amount of consumer utility there, uh, and it's it's. I think it's creating a ton of controversy because we're all trying to figure out if the utility or the technology that advances the utility, such as what I mentioned around automated um, border control, is moving faster than the threats. And the threats are the same technology could be used for facial recognition and potentially you know, do everything from put people on the wrong list where they can't get on a train because they're social credit score is seen as a threat to an autocratic government. So everything from them being tracked to having their rights and privileges inhibited um, uh, is a serious, I mean, a really serious issue. Um, anyways, but I, it might, in sum, I think the decentralization, just as the cloud has offered, I mean, what's the cloud? The cloud is decentralization of data such that you can use scale and processing power 
to to create sort of real time updates at scale um, and leverage processing power to offer more utility that gets decentralized back to the end user at the end, you know, to the end client. So this is the same thing. It just it involves attaching that data set to an individual. So there's tremendous upside, tremendous utility, but also tremendous risks. And I think we're all trying to figure out what is scaling faster, the utility or the risks. Right. Like, cause like everybody, like, uh, as far as I can tell, like everybody is like talking about the pros of like the these digital identities or decentralized identities, whatever. Uh, but no one really gives like the users a like a better um, like picture of like what is the potential risk of these uh, say these like information or data or identity connections. Uh, what if they're online? What if they're like? stored permanently what is the potential risk for them i mean like is it how do you think about this kind of like uh like saying because like uh, users are now getting more sense of like what is the pr potential as you said utility of these decentralized identities um do you think this this will create a huge problem for them in the future because like they don't really know the risk behind it uh, what is or what is what is the potential risk that could happen in the future if they don't really care or if they don't even know what is behind it? So there's a, a lot of nuance or uh, to try and answer that question, and I'll, I'll just take two ways to segment the nuance. One is geography, and one is generational, and I'll I'll take them in reverse order. When people talk about privacy or risk to privacy, they're usually over the age of forty and living in Brussels or DC. People under the age of 40 are very happy to tell strangers around the world where they are, what they are doing, at what time, and with whom. So with just a thin layer of AI put on top of Uber or Instagram, you know, an entity that you don't know that well could decide or figure out if you are HIV positive, if you are um, going to terminate a pregnancy, if you were going to an anti-communist party meeting, whatever it might be. So there is, as you get further up the age ladder, you, you see people more concerned about privacy. Uh, with exception of, just generally speaking, people hear privacy and they think it's, they kind of bought into this narrative that Oh, it's dangerous. So I'm 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 concerned about it. But their actions, there's a lot of consumer dissonance. Someone will, you know, say privacy now and act concerned, and then take a selfie of themselves at Coachella, uh, and log into Uber, and then log into all manner of social media applications, such that third parties know a great deal about them. The other thing is geography, and that is. Identity or decentralized identity poses different risks in different domains. And that is, I think in a wealthy economy or a democracy, I want to say wealthy, a democracy, there are institutions that decide, okay, there are only certain things we can do with someone's identity and privacy. So if you're in Manhattan or London, there's very few places you can go where a camera doesn't catch your image. Uh, and wouldn't capture enough of your image to use facial recognition to identify who you are, where you are, and what you're doing and with whom. And in uh, Britain, in the UK, and in America, there are pretty serious uh, laws that say, okay, we're, you can't just use that data to create lists of people who might be a threat to democracy. We believe in free speech, and we don't create lists of people who are seen as a threat I mean, we have in the past, but um, it's there are institutions and pretty pretty strict privacy laws. Um, that's not the case, I think, in other uh, economies, developing economies or autocracies, where they would like enforced identity, such that they could reverse engineer comments and use algorithms to identify people who are not supportive of the current regime. Um, and then create a series of tracking tools or inhibit their rights or inhibit their reach such that, such that their freedoms and their movement and even their economics and their prosperity and at some point even their physical safety might be a threat. So 
from a consumer standpoint, the older you go, the more kind of real the concern. I would call it more faux concern for young people because uh, the music doesn't match the words in terms of their actual actions. And then when you're talking about identity and the risks, it's sort of like, well, what is the risk of decentralized identity? It's like, well, tell me what nation we're talking about. I'd, I think in a non, I think anonymity is very important in a place like Iran or in autocratic states where we need people or want to provide cloud cover, the cloud cover of anonymity for journalists talking about what's going on there. I think that the, the um, downsides of anonymity and that is a tearing at the social fabric of America and also giving bad actors, sometimes external actors, to come in and make arguments and disagreements go from civil disagreements to very incendiary. Uh, I think that there are a lot of third party or bad actors or foreign governments who are doing that actively now in the U.S. And because there is no identification and because we do value anonymity, we've ended up in a situation where I think it's led to greater polarization and greater tearing at the fabric of America. If you look at America geopolitically, we're more competitive right now than we've ever been. We are food and energy independent. We have the best vaccines in the world. We're pretty prosperous. We're growing again. Our economy's growing again. Our inflation is seems to be coming down. A quarter of China is under some sort of temporary or partial lockdown. They're very worried about COVID there. So we're sort of the fastest tortoise right now. Um, but I think the real issue in America, and again, I'll loop it back to identity, is we don't like each other. And we're sort of eating each other from the inside out. A third of each political party thinks the other party, members of the other party, is a mortal enemy. 20% would be happy with an autocrat as long as it was his or her autocrat. And 54% of Democrats are worried their kid is going to marry a Republican. And I believe that there are bad actors that under the kind of umbrella of anonymity are sowing that sort of dissent internally. So again, I, I, it's, a difficult, it's difficult to make sort of blanket statements around whether decentralized identity or anonymity is a good or a bad thing until you have a conversation around the cohort specifically and what region and what nation we're talking about. Wow, thank you so much for this like pretty decent like answer to that. Because like, I guess like you, you made a really great point that on the decentralized identity, like when we're talking about it, we should have like context because like the, it does it has like different like uh kind of like meeting or or different kind of like impact in different like different uh, geological uh, geological uh in, uh like context. I mean, uh in in many different countries, like maybe being anonymous is quite like important, like you said, but also like in in di- in other contexts in other scenarios like. When, uh, if we're talking about some like a digital um, uh, scenario, uh, when you want to like try to build a reputation, uh, uh, and then you want it to be transparent, you want it to be like uh, traceable, because like you want everybody to know that your reputation is built by uh, doing what kind of like things, aka history. So um, maybe that's when we need like this kind of like traceable or like on all transparent uh, identity. But when you're trying to do some like uh, I don't know some sensitive or like private like things that well like privacy is more like a, like rights, like human rights. So when you, whenever you don't really want to expose some of your history or some of your like actions on on both like in dig- uh, in both like physical world and just digital world you should have this kind of like right to do so cuz the thing uh, the reason why we're bringing this conversation into uh, like why decentralized identity matters is that uh, we don't see such a right where or we don't see such uh, like a platform or product that allows users to choose what to expose and what to hide. Um, so maybe that's uh, the reason why we're talking about decentralization all the time because it gives users another like option or an alternative option when they feel that um, they don't really want to be exposed or they don't really want to be uh, traced by these like large platforms or even abused by them. Uh, we do have another choice. Uh, maybe like that's why we 
all love like this kind of new technology for uh, managing and uh, creating it or managing your uh, identities is that uh, you can create however like uh, like millions of like different different identities uh, as you wish because uh, you don't really have to sign up to a platform instead you just generate your identity but um maybe that's the um the power of decentralization or not even decentralization is just power of math um so in your opinion can you just talk about like what decentralization actually work in this kind of like scenario like because like in my opinion like decentralization is never our like uh now our goal because like we don't really want to do like we want to don't really want to be decentralized by doing decentralization then uh what is the point of decentralization here what do you think it's uh, the most important thing about uh doing this like uh, whole decentralization movement nowadays oh so there 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 are there are if you talk about trust you can have a trust there's there's institutions and there's governments or core private and public institutions. So the uh, governmental institutions, you can't have uh, anonymity. So if you had anonymity and passport control, the whole thing would break down because they they most nations want to know exactly who is coming in to their country, crossing their borders, and they want to be able to attach their identity to a series of past actions for security threats or or to maintain maintain borders. So we're going to always have some sort of decentralized identity across certain institutions. The question is, do you trust those institutions to uphold law? So if if you commit a petty crime in New York, the chances are they can find you, but there's certain laws around what type of identity can be used for what types of crimes. And there's certain identity technologies that can only be used for national security threats. So even if you commit a crime, and using certain technology, they could probably find that person. Uh, our institutions and our laws, uh, similar to our search and seizure laws, say the violation of privacy is too great to warrant uh, warrant that um, uh, uh, solving that solving that crime. the The weird thing is is just how much trust we've put into uh, uh, private institutions. So, Google has ninety three percent share of search. There are three billion searches a day. And Google kind of knows, you know, knows your what STDs you have, the sexual fetishes you have, whether you're terminating a pregnancy, planning to get divorced, planning, planning to come out, um, uh, you know, change your gender if you're about to leave your job. Uh, and we decide every day to tell it all of this. Um, and so we trust one entity. Uh, that really isn't regulated. There's been no regulation passed around big tech, meaningful regulation in the last five years. But we trust Google. Um, we trust uh, Apple. We've decided that privacy as a whole is a good thing. And Apple has a, a commercial interest in the privacy argument because they're an app economy. And privacy, or what you would call violations of privacy or data collection or decentralized identity has been used to great effect at Google and Meta, who take decent, take that data, and then uh, and then uh, massage it, process it, and then spit it back to advertisers and say this individual is in Dubai, is or her, his his or her his or her taste in hotels, he's with his two boys, and they start serving me ads for the ultimate VR experience in the Dubai Mall, and that is a very effective ad, which they can charge a high CPM for because it's so accurate because of decentralized identity um, and then serve back to me relevant ads and create a ton of money. And, and you have Apple passing AT, ATT that says you can't track people because they want, they don't want their business isn't built on an ad model. It's built on an app model. So, you know, there's, there's tremendous economic power, uh, but the notion what, what's extraordinary is just how much trust people have placed in organizations if google was hacked imagine your name and your face uh above a chronological listing of every search you've ever done you would have social chaos if that data was hacked 
Um, but Google so far has earned a lot of trust because that hack hasn't taken place. But we've had decentralized identity. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the United States, knows your HIV status. And they will attach it to an identity. But, but we trust that the CDC will only attach it when it's for uh, our, our, our well-being or our, to our health. It's not such that someone can come uh, find us and then put us in quarantine somewhere. So, I mean, there's tremendous, I don't, I think, I think the genie's out of the bottle. I think it's happening now. I think it's going to continue to happen. I would argue that the key is to ensure we have very strong institutions that make thoughtful regulations and pass laws to ensure that our identity or decentralized identity is only used when appropriate and to our benefit and also punish companies that when they're hacked and they haven't put in place made requisite investments in our identity and our personal data that they pay a pretty severe cost because right now if 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 our data is hacked for the purposes of weaponizing an election uh, and I'm talking about Meta. They pay a five billion dollar fine, which is about eleven weeks of cash flow and about three weeks of um, three weeks of revenue. So I, I, I think it comes down to this. I, I believe technology you can't constrain it or dampen it. What I think is more important is that we elect really thoughtful, smart people that have a background in technology. Less than eight percent of our elected representatives in the U.S. have a background in technology or engineering. We need more people who understand these technologies and can implement laws and regulations such that uh, we know how to handle this data and we know, we know what it can be used for, what it can't be used for, and also ensure that companies have the right incentives uh, to ensure they put in place the right safeguards such that our data isn't weaponized against us. Right, right. So, like, because, like, y you also talk about, like, trust over, like, private, uh, uh, like, private companies, but like these like kind of like private companies are actually doing good like quotation mark good to the users because the reason like one of the reason why we don't think that we can leave these platforms or leave the services is that um they just provide so much like convenience like so much of so many benefits to us and then they uh like because uh, like yeah apparently they're uh, uh, abusing our data uh, even against us because like we're uh, like we're not just customers to these companies we're more like a product to, to them and then the real customers is like uh, those like the advertisers but still like we're provided like free products we can use like Google we can use like Gmail and stuff like for free but um, how do you think about like uh, uh, like these like uh, if we can find a like trade-off between like privacy and then other convenience like we 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 are given nowadays and it, can we or can we even find this like trade-off in the future well i think we 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 find a trade-off every day because I, I mean i'll when i get off this call i'll get an uber for me and my sons and we're going to dinner in dubai so Uber knows where I'm going, at what time, and how long I'm there. That is not something I, I necessarily want other people knowing. And with a thin layer of AI put on top of that, they could say, all right, this person is uh, cheating on their wife, or this person is going to terminate a pregnancy, or this person, you know, we have, we have states in the United States now that are, are saying that if you help somebody terminate a pregnancy, you're breaking the law. And with a thin layer of AI on, on top of Uber data, you could figure out not only who is going to terminate a pregnancy, but who is helping them do that. But we trust Uber. We, we've decided a for-profit company has made the requisite investments to ensure that that data cannot be uh, will not be weaponized or hacked. And we trust that the federal government has enough uh, uh, privacy laws that that data cannot be subpoenaed, that you're not going to end up in court and have your Uber data displayed and be accused of terminating a pregnancy and potentially go to jail because they subpoena data from Uber. So every day we make a trade off what, where there's a disconnect is people talk a very big game about privacy, but every day they trade off utility. They opt for utility. They want their searches to be relevant. They want coupons. They want relevant ads. 
They want free products. Um, and so every day, if you, if you look at, uh, again, the term in marketing is consumer dissonance, and that is the delta between what people say and what they do. People give up an extraordinary amount of their data um, to um, third parties every day that with, again, with a certain layer of intelligence, you could find, you know, you could make a lot of fairly correct assumptions about that person's activities, political leanings, relationships, who's important to them, their health status, their sexual orientation, all kinds of things. Um, uh, so we make that trade-off every day. It's sort of wild west right now. The biggest thing to happen around regulation was that there's been such a void of regulation because government has not been able to keep up with advances in technology. Processing power is increasing much faster than the expertise of our government. And so the two people who've had the most impact on regulation have been one, Tim Cook, who decided to give all iOS users the opportunity to opt out of tracking. And people decided, yes, there's been some knock-on effects there. It's actually been very damaging for a lot of small businesses who can no longer target potential customers in a granular fashion at, a, at a, the same ROI they used to. But people, when faced with a very easy choice and don't see a lot of downside, go, okay, even if I see shittier ads or less relevant ads, that hurts meta. It doesn't really hurt me. And so I think, what is it, 83% uh, have opted out. And then the second person that's ended up being a de facto regulator is Taylor Swift. And when 4 million people tried to buy tickets for a concert and Live Nation site crashed, it became pretty obvious that Live Nation doesn't have a lot of incentive to make the requisite investments in technology because they own 70% of all live events. So you don't really have any choice but to go to Live Nation. So this calls on a host of issues, but I think what it comes right down to is we need very thoughtful academics, um, psychologists, neuroscientists, adolescent psychologists when we talk about kids, and really thoughtful regulators to decide what are the rules and regulations and the laws here around what data can be stored, who can store it, who can access it, and what happens when your company is hacked and someone's privacy is violated. Uh, but I think it's a nation by nation basis. Where I end up is that in a, in a wealthy nation, I think the anonymity kind of call sign, call sign has resulted in more harm than good. I think if you start attacking someone for their beliefs, their political beliefs, and 90% of the comments are from a bot, I don't think that is helping the discourse in America. I think the biggest discourse, the biggest threat to America right now is, again, this kind of internal strife of this polarization. And a lot of it is a function that uh, this kind of anonymity, I don't know, mythology or the benefits or the call sign of anonymity. I think what you'll see, uh, I think we would benefit from, from forced user identity on platforms um, I think Twitter would most benefit from forced identity. But what you'll probably see is that platforms and nations will emerge as like um, um, free zones. So there will probably be a nation or a city and platforms. And we already have them. 4chan and 8chan are the Wild West. But what, what you find is people don't want a Wild West. The more moderated a prop platform the more profitable it is. 4chan and 8chan are the least moderated. They're worthless. Parler, Getter, Rumble are not very moderated. It's pretty much kind of the wild, you know, not the wildest West, but the wild West. They are terrible businesses going out of business. And then there's Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, you know, fairly serious moderation. And then the most moderated platform is the most profitable and fastest growing platform. And I would argue the fourth most valuable company in the world right now, and that's TikTok. So despite a lot of the arm waving and concerns, the more moderation you have, the more profitable. And I would argue the part of moderation or enforcing moderation is enforcing identity. Uh, but again, it's, it's, you can't, I think the sweet spot is you enforce identity but there has to be serious protections around what data can be used uh, uh, w because of because we were enforcing identity. So we have free speech laws in America. You can pretty much say anything to anybody about anyone. That is a really wonderful thing. It's a hallmark of a free society. So that means enforcing identity doesn't pose the same level of risk 
is another nation where you can be jailed for saying something about, you know, Khomeini. Uh, then anonymity becomes more important and enforcing identity is probably a bad idea. Oh, wow. I think we're kind of like running out of time, but it sounds like you mentioned like Twitter and a freedom of speech because like, because uh, like that uh, what we have in the U.S., but uh, we don't think that we have that anymore on Twitter. How do you, like, what do you think, what are your th- thoughts on like Twitter's like new changing policy in the features? Uh, say you cannot just uh, like uh, promote like other like social media uh, sites like uh, Mastodon. A lot of people are moving to Mastodon and other like uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, Meta, Instagram and stuff. Uh, how do you think like how can like users like us or creators like maintain their freedom of speech in the like on Twitter or even like in the cyberspace? And then that will be the last question for today. So I would argue that right now Twitter doesn't have any policies. It has the blood sugar level of one man at that day. I, I don't, I, you know, this this notion that uh, uh, Elon Musk was purchasing Twitter under the auspices of free speech is just blatantly false. Um, he talks a big game about free speech, and most recently he started kicking journalists off of Twitter. So I don't, you know, there's just. Uh, I, I don't think Mr. Musk has any concept of what free speech is, nor does he have any fidelity to it. I think it was just sort of a convenient talking point. But you don't talk about free speech and then start kicking journalists uh, off of your platform. Um, it's, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's a private platform. I don't think it's the public square. I think the free speech argument is a bit of a head fake because... You know, if you go, if I, if I go on MSNBC, they don't have to put on Ted Cruz at the end of every program and let Ted Cruz speak. When I go on Fox, they don't have to let AOC come on. They get to decide whose voices come on the platform and whose don't. It's a private company. Twitter gets to make those decisions. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't see, I, I personally just as if I were an investor in Twitter, if I were an investor in a platform, uh, there's just a very strong correlation between moderation and profitability and growth. And so uh, I've stopped posting on Twitter. I find that the comments, uh, the very aggressive comments um, are are so vile and so, I don't know, just sort of inappropriate that I have no desire to engage in it anymore. And the notion that you need some sort of anonymity uh, if you're a journalist trying to report on human rights violations out of Iran or somewhere else, I'm sure there are ways to use some sort of decentralized secure mechanism to grant you an account and then ensure that is kind of the topics you're talking about. But I, I just don't, I, I think Twitter is a mess. I, I think it's, I think it's, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I've actually, I'm not a mess and I'm, I think Scott, did you get cut off? Oh, I thought it was, it was my problem, but yeah. Oh wow! Maybe the objection against Twitter it's is too platform. too fierce. Oh, you're back. Great. Oh, sorry. Um, basically, I I I think Twitter right now is. Just uh, to, to be blunt, just a total shit show. And the person running it says one thing one day that he's into free speech and the kicks journalists off the next day, talks about the importance of anonymity and then accuses people of essentially sex crimes, sells billions of dollars of stock and then refuses to pay his employees severance. So, I mean, I personally decided I'm no longer going to paint the fence and create ad impressions for an organization like that. But he and each of these companies has the right to do what they want. Um, but again, from a shareholder standpoint, the more moderation, the more shareholder value, part of moderation is enforcing identity. And I think in a modern society with strong First Amendment and strong strong laws and protections of civil liberties, I think anonymity has been absolutely weaponized to the detriment of national security and just our national, I think it's made our discourse much more coarse. And I think Twitter has played a, uh, a ne- very negative role and with just a small amount of 
identification enforcement, a small, you know, additional amount of content moderation. Um, I think they could solve this. I think, I think Twitter is going to collapse. I think it's already collapsing and kind of a, a ball of flame, if you will. But yeah, so glad we have like alternative options because that's what I think, at least to me, like uh, the most important thing in this world. Because like decentralized entities, where like all the things we talk about today, just providing users another option because we never had one, and then that's why we're. I think a lot of people are working on this in, in this field to uh, like, uh, to give users more and more options that's more towards their like home benefits and rights. And then, yeah, I mean, I just don't, don't really want to like uh, spend more time on that. And then so, uh, and I, I think like uh, Professor Scott Gallery is gonna uh, go, I guess. So yeah. um, I guess we can just cut it off today for now. So I will just uh, get back to, to Hannah if you do wanna like do some conclusion and then thanks so much Scott for coming today. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks to Linda for reaching yeah. out. Yeah, thank you, Linda, for the invite, and thank you, Professor Galloway, for, for the great sharing on identities. I hope you enjoy your dinner with your boys. Oh, thanks very much, Anna. Yeah. yeah. Happy holidays. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, happy holidays. Great. Well, thank you, Scott, and also thank you, Issa, for, for the very insightful questions. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think I was really... I really resonate with a lot of the things that Scott just mentioned, especially around um, kind of one thinking about the, both the pros and cons of identities by geography and how it impacts different regimes and different uh, kind of um, like social uh, di different like social um, like models and like formats like in um, the more like developed regions versus like developing and underdeveloped regions like having your like digital identities. Uh, kind of having all of these like personal sensitive information will have different implication and also yeah like thinking about uh social networks today and how it like whether it really functions as a, a public utility to allow for civil discourse or uh are we still kind of like battling like is twitter uh, like how negative a role is twitter playing in terms of um intervening with the democratic um like processes and discourse we have in the u.s um that's another really uh, great point to to think about um i think there's a lot more uh, glorification of uh, the roles like Twitter plays and then kind of Elon Musk is making himself like looking like kind of a, a hero trying to uh, do a lot of things. But whether the the changes that we see today bring more like harm than, or benefit is something that we're like continue seeing like unfolding for sure. Um, yeah. So uh, I want to also open up the floor to whoever wants to join uh, and, you know, ask questions or share some of their thoughts or feedback. Uh, if not, we can uh, wrap up today. I see Jay is connecting. Is Jay still here? Let's see. Yeah. Um, I think I, I think we lost her, but um. Yeah, anyways, it's, it's a great turnout today. I uh, really appreciate, like, again, having a, such a good conversation between Issa and uh, Scott today. Um, and so as an, I guess, alternative or way to pr uh, better protect users' uh, privacy and digital rights, 
as we are, uh, you know, leaving a lot more and more of our information, our identities across the digital space. Um, like Issa and I, we're working on NextID as an open source, a completely transparent uh, decentralized identity protocol that allows users to have their own like identity that aggregates, you know, your <clears throat> your profiles across uh, Web2, social media, GitHub, and different wallet addresses uh, uh, on Web3 as a kind of a one step to allow people build decentralized apps that truly have, allow users to own their own data. Yeah, so if you're interested, definitely um, you can check out the Twitter uh, handle NextID for uh, more of the project update. Um, and for Web3 Social Club, we'll be inviting more and more uh, builders and thought leaders in the space uh, to discuss with us what happened in like kind of Web3 Social and just beyond like uh, open uh, open internet and social networks uh, in the upcoming days uh, for like a year end wrap up and a new year outlook. So stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, and uh, my DMs always open as well uh, if you're interested in chat more about decentralized identities and uh, Web3 Social or just really anything um, fun. Cool. All right. Thank you, everyone, and happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays, bro.